for turning up today. I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors here, particularly um, Luke Mosley. I've been on Baby Watch all week and I wasn't sure whether I was going to get here today. I only let him know at 9.30 last night that I'd be presenting, so he's been on standby, so thanks to Luke for that. Um, just a bit of project background. Um, we're talking here, um, I think Luke had a presentation of his own yesterday where we spoke about the Lower Murray Reclaimed Irrigation Area. So we're talking about the um, stretch of reclaimed floodplain between basically Manham and Murray Bridge, um, which you see when you drive over the old um, Swanport Bridge or, um, sorry, the Swanport Bridge or the old um, Highway Bridge there in Murray Bridge. So it's part of a broader program that's being funded through the South Australian River Murray Sustainability Program, so um, SARMS, so it's funded through PERSA, and the industry-led research sub-program within that. So. But what we've done, um, we've integrated this project with a project the NRM board is delivering through um, the Australian government as well. So um, the on-farm irrigation efficiency program is linked to the Murray-Darling Basin plan. So under that program, um, which the board, NRM board is a delivery partner in South Australia for uh, irrigators return part of their water entitlement to undertake um, an irrigation efficiency program. And as pa a part of that water that they save is returned to the Australian government in exchange for funding and that um, water return then goes back to the environment um, to bridge the gap there. So a lot of this project work has come out of the drought, um, but what we're finding now, it's going to be a legacy impact. So as much as it was driven out of the drought, it's a problem that's going to persist. So what we're trying to do through this project is um, work out how we're going to manage it for the long term and um, just live, live with the acid, if you like. So um, just again, a bit more about the Lillimere region itself. So a bit over 5,000 5, hectares of irrigation um, across over 20 separate irrigation areas. Um, the area actually began to be reclaimed back in the 1800s, uh, late 1800s, and um, obviously when the barrages went in uh, as well, it provided that constant pool level until we hit the drought, obviously, so, and that's one of the issues we're dealing with, of course. Uh, traditionally, uh, it's all gravity-fed border check irrigation, so you can imagine um, these bays are sitting quite low um, compared to the river height, so naturally water moves on quite quickly and quite efficiently, so we hear a lot of, I guess, negative connotations as soon as you hear about flood irrigation and surface irrigation, but the Limery, I think, is pretty a pretty unique system in the, in the context of flood irrigation because the river is essentially the delivery channel. We're not running water long lengths to get onto bays. It's the, water, the river's essentially sitting adjacent to the delivery channel there, so we don't have a lot of losses. So um, it is quite an efficient system, and because of the nature of the soil types there as well, they're very heavy, black cracking clays. It's probably the only system that really works in terms of putting a lot of water on quickly. So done well, it's a very efficient system. Um, it's also an area that obviously has its own uh, unique set of hydrologic issues because it's the lowest point in the landscape. It's got a shallow a water table sitting beneath it because of the, the, the river regulation. And it's also um, where all the regional groundwater is moving to naturally. So these guys are dealing with water coming from both underneath and also coming in from the, the landscape more regionally. So it's quite unique in that sense. And as some pictures will show, and as people have probably already seen um, out of this region, it's been pretty severely impacted by the Millennium Drought. Um, I won't go into detail about the formation of the acid sulphate soils, but you can see here, um, traditionally, we've got a very shallow water table inside a metre of the surface before the drought. This point here where we lost um, the water, so I think the lowest point that, um, got down to minus 1.5 AHD, I think, for memory. Um, but you can see that then corresponds to the regional water table dropping right down, um, exposing these soils here that have traditionally been saturated all the time. Um, the deep cracking, obviously oxygen gets down those cracks. The, the acid formation process happens. Um, post drought, obviously the, water oh, the river level has returned, brings the water table back up and obviously bringing with it um, the acidic sediments and that's what we're trying to manage now. So, um, yeah, so... That's a pretty um, stark picture, isn't it, in terms of what the uh, area looked like pre-drought versus uh, um, what it is post-drought, and it's a problem that's still persisting. So as much as we're seeing uh, some improvement, um, it's a pretty sure sign you've got an acid problem when you see water that colour. So it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty serious issue in terms of the pH is um, less than three. Um, its areas are becoming strongly salinised, obviously acidic, uh, sodic and eroded. So there's a lot of land management issues that we're trying to deal with here. Um, but a lot of our response has been how do we actually do that, the response in the context of maintaining production in an area like this. So it's a challenge, but that's what this project work is about. Um, and obviously with the 
influence of climate change and also water reform, it's unlikely that this region will have less water available, uh, available to it going forward, so these problems will be a, a further challenge going forward. So, um, Just a few more picks there to highlight the, some of the issues we saw, so you can see some pretty severe cracking. As you saw in the opening slide, there was a, a dairy farmer at Maipalonga who was actually down in a crack, so yes, that man's no Aaron Sandlands, but he's also about this high, so um, he's down there and uh, it shows you the extent of the cracking, so it's pretty severe. I've uh, just uh, shown an example there of a soil water probe that we have at Long Flat. So that's um, back towards the uh, end of 2011. So you can see what's actually happening. Anyone who's familiar with um, soil water monitoring will know that you put water on the top, it normally goes to the first sensor and then moves down the profile. What we're actually seeing here because of the cracking and the preferential flow pass is the water was actually moving along the bottom and coming back up to the surface. So it just highlights how severe that cracking was. and Obviously, you're trying to irrigate and that's highly inefficient, so preferential flow paths and yeah, not very good at all. Uh, just a bit about the response and recovery. So what we're trying to do is very much an applied um, research project. Um, these are, uh, this property here at Long Flat, which is the top photo. Uh, so Long Flat's almost directly opposite, or it's just downstream of Sturt Reserve. You know Murray Bridge, it's on the eastern side of the river between the two bridges, so that site is still it's no longer used as a dairy farm, but they are running beef cattle and, and doing a lot of hay production there. So you would define it as a, a commercial irrigated enterprise at the moment. And the one below that is at Mo, uh, Mobilong, which is um, behind the, the TNR pasture or Thomas Foods as it's now known. So just to give you some context, so you can see one down the bottom hasn't had a lot of active irrigation on it. You can see from the uh, photography the difference in terms of the way those um, paddocks look in terms of condition. So you can see that very visually. Um, so in terms of the field results to date, so as I mentioned, these guys are just getting on with their businesses. So we've, we're doing this work around them. So this is work they're doing. So at Long Flat here, uh, they've gone back in and renovated their channels, uh, re-laser leveled their bays. Um, and what we're looking at is seeing what sort of improvement um, we're getting out of the irrigation upgrades. And with the drainage, obviously, the more drainage you create, the bigger issue. So what we're trying to do is make sure the irrigation is efficient, create less drainage. Um, and obviously that means less discharges that go back into the River Murray. So you can see, uh, just, out, just coming out of the drought, um, this is a per, per irrigation event, so you can see almost five megs per hectare had to be applied to get the water on. So anyone who knows about surface irrigation, that is a highly inefficient um, volume to be putting on. Um, as we've seen paddocks sort of naturally recover, so you can see 2014, they've rehydrated. So you can see that's coming down. So um, prior to the drought, some areas were getting as low as a half a meg per hectare in terms of efficiency. So you can see long flat here, it's starting to get somewhere back near there. And 2015-16 actually shows an irrigation um, that went on into a, a laser levelled bay and a, a bay that's been modernised and renewed. And you can see it, it was about 0.7 um, megs per hectare. So it's really positive in terms of if you put the work in, you can recover the, um, the, the area, uh, but it does take a lot of work. And, in terms of the graph here on the right hand side, it's just showing the lateral movement. So on that uh, uh, graphic a few slides back, we showed the, where the lateral piezometers are installed. So the idea of that is when we irrigate a bay, we're looking at whether that water actually stays contained within that bay with a lot of the cracking that goes on. We're seeing preferential flow paths and you talk to irrigators and they'll say, I watered this bay here, but the water's popping up five bays across. So obviously once it gets down, there's ability for it to move everywhere and that's um, what we're trying to manage here. So, um, but you can see here the um, green line shows a non-laser leveled irrigation event versus the red one. So you can see less impact on, on the groundwater, regional groundwater level there through the piezometers. So you can see it's actually having a, an effect in terms of <coughs> uh, reduced, um, <coughs> sorry, reduced amount of um, drainage is actually getting down and lateral movement. So again, that's very positive. Um, as I mentioned at the start, as much as this has been a legacy um, or it's been caused by the millennium drought, it's an issue that's persisting and it's one we just have to, to manage with going forward. So you can see uh, here on the slide on the right hand side that the acid is persisting. Um, we've done some modelling as well, which is um, where Freeman Cook's been involved. So it's showing that there's sort of two to four irrigations of a year, about one mega hectare can minimise some of this. Um, Looking at uh, keeping the water content at depth mostly above a critical water content. And one of the things from terms of a policy context, uh, this area 
has a unique allocation called environmental land management, and that's to deal with some of the unique land management issues it faces. So in order to try and keep that saline groundwater contained and managed and keep these areas productive. And so some of the work that's coming out of this is, is um, really informing how we can actually use that land um, management allocation and make sure um, it's applied because it's, in some areas it's difficult to get it on because of um, limitations with infrastructure. Um, I'll just jump over this pretty quickly, but this uh, just shows some of the, the modelling scenarios that have been done. Uh, the black one being irrigating every time there's 100 mils or one mega hectare. So you can see there the black lines represent an irrigation event. Um, and you can see as you let the soil profile dry out, yes, it means there's less irrigations that you need to apply, but the, um, this is a very busy slide, but what it basically meant is showing that at surface, um, the less you irrigate, the more salinised it becomes. So it's about finding the right balance and clearly the T1 treatment um, provides the best outcome in terms of salinity. Uh, so these, are, think, these are, le are learnings that we can actually use to inform how we deal with the environmental land management allocation particularly. So that's down the bottom. You can see there that the, the um, T1 treatment clearly de delivers the best salinity outcome and that's what we need to use to, um, I guess, reinforce the importance of applying Elmer irrigation. Um, so in some areas we don't have, uh, so as I was saying, it was traditionally a, a border check area, but if river levels drop, then that border check irrigation system doesn't work overly well because water doesn't run uphill, unfortunately. So, um, so one of the things we're looking at is if we don't have access or we don't have an ability to get water on through normal gravity means, are there options like travelling irrigators that we can actually get some water on through a pressurised system just to, just to manage the soil and keep them hydrated? Um, and the other big area, um, big issue in this area is the impact of um, people who are not necessarily managing for commercial. They might put a little one or two irrigations on a year, but if their neighbour is trying to run a commercial irrigation enterprise, um, if they keep their paddocks quite dry, it has an impact on what someone's trying to do next door. So that's an issue that we need to manage. Um, and that's pretty much it. So just in terms of acknowledgements, I want to thank the Australian Government for the funding, so both for the on-time irrigation efficiency program and also through the South Australian River Murray Sustainability Program. Um, clearly also to, to, to PERSA who are uh, managing the SARMS program and particularly the industry-led research program within that. Um, EPA are a partner in this project, also SA Water, uh, Uni of Adelaide obviously, Frim Cook, um, Limeria Landholders and um, Dairy SA. So thanks very much. Um, I think that's always the question that comes up. So, um, and I think there's been a lot of work to say, well, if we were to have all these pie wallers, if you like, so anyone familiar with pie waller, it's a reclaimed swamp that's been turned back into a wetland. If we wanted to do that, replicate that right along the whole reach of the, the Limeria, well, it's probably going to take more water to, to have that sort of system than it does for having people to manage it. So, I mean, I look at things um, and say, well, a lot of these land management issues are managed if you have production on them. I think that's still the most cost effective way to actually manage this area. That's a, probably a personal opinion, but it's, at the end of the day, a lot of the, the worst affected areas in this region are the, are the areas that are unmanaged. So a lot of the pest issues, the, the drying and all that, that gets looked after if someone's actually there trying to produce on the land because it's in their best interest to have productive land. So I think and again, it's my opinion, I think we should be doing whatever we can to encourage production. It's a market-based system, obviously. Like We can't say all of a sudden make the dairy industry more profitable than it is now, but, um, or any other industry for that matter, but I think if we can get industry back there, um, it's a good outcome. Mm. Probably, yeah.